Tonight, we look at the story that has been told about the murder of John Benet Ramsey and why so many think her parents guilty and what this tells us about the America she so briefly lived in. Yeah. You brought the note to John? I don't remember, I tell you, you just, you know, that you morning is so note? chaotic. You don't? I don't remember exactly, but... Well, it was, it was, uh... I started screaming, there's a note, you know. It and was, you look in John Benet's room, she's not there. What's the first thing you do? Larry, we don't remember. This is three years ago. We've been through this a hundred times. You wrote a book about it, so, I mean, you must have we, said... We, we outlined it in the book, uh... Basically. I felt like I'd been kicked by a horse. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 42 in the 50-part series dealing with the world-famous John Benet Ramsey case. In this episode, we're going to look at the March 17 interview with Larry King on CNN in the year 2000. This is the uh, interview shortly after... They went on to Barbara Walters, and in fact, this is exactly what uh, how the interview kicked off was the Ramses being asked on Barbara Walters, "Have you ever taken? Were you ever asked to take a lie detector test? Would you take one?" And Larry then picked up the cue on that particular topic. Let's listen in. Uh, you had said recently in an interview that you were willing to take a lie detector test, and apparently the Boulder Police are now saying. Let's set it up. Will you do it? We have. We were asked, had we been asked to take a lie detector test? We said no. We were asked, would we? We said certainly we would. Uh, we would expect it to be fair, and we would expect the results to be public. And then you would take, well, by fair, how, what's the determination of that, Patsy? Well, I think it has to be someone of... Um, national repute. National repute. FBI man. Independent, you know, a professional polygrapher you know we, we, we've been told that um, that uh... so three years after the fact the Ramsey still haven't taken a polygraph and now they are in the media in the media spotlight and asked you know are you going to take a polygraph and their response is what well, oh, well, we'd like it to be done by a professional so and of course the Boulder police were trying to foist on them an amateur you know a um, a, a school kid with a sort of an amateur uh, kit and, and that's why that they haven't done it for three years because th that's that's some kind of amateur that was going on I'm obviously being sarcastic here but I mean do you think that they weren't going to use a professional what is quite interesting in that little segment is Larry King says something along the lines of FBI right because some of the the best um uh, po polygraphy tests are conducted by these, you know, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, th that's who conducted the polygraph on Chris Watts and also the FBI, they also do it. And Patsy doesn't really respond to the answer, she, she sort of just um, kind of waffles on a little bit. And that is a narrative on its own is how the Ramses eventually, bear in mind this interview took place in March. Um, I think they eventually had a polygraph which is inconclusive. In other words, they didn't pass it, but you couldn't say that they failed it. It was a little bit similar to the Ramses version of the handwriting of the ransom note. Also that it was inconclusive, that they couldn't quite exclude Patsy, but you know, it wasn't definitively heard. That is their version from their experts. So even from their own people who they selected to do their own polygraph, the first test was inconclusive. But the thing that's very interesting is that they avoided doing it uh, via the FBI. And I think there's quite a interesting reason why the Ramses wouldn't want to do it via, say, the CBI or the FBI. And it's exactly what happened to Chris Watts is... It became this huge question and answer session. You know, some of it is getting to a baseline, but a lot of it is having the opportunity then to reinterrogate these people. And do you think the Ramses wanted to be interviewed 
by law enforcement again? Do you think the Ramses wanted to be in that position? And, you know, ultimately they, they never were interviewed by the CBI or FBI, unlike, for example, Chris Watts. Now, what I think is also important to bear in mind is the purpose behind this particular interview was to promote their book. And I want to talk about that briefly. Um, you know, the death of innocence, the cover, the title and all that kind of thing. But just in a general sense, the Ramses are going on to CNN to promote a book that they are that, that they've written and are trying to sell. At this point, I think John Ramsey was already unemployed. He would probably burned through a lot of loot, paying for Hal Haddon, paying for representation, paying for um, public relations people paying for a heck of a lot of lawyers, not only for himself, his wife, his son, and his ex-wife, and, and so on, um, you know, and all these experts, uh, John Douglas, um, the, the, I think there was something like half a dozen handwriting experts, all of that would ultimately cost money you had to pay these people, essentially to be part of Team Ramsey, and I, I would imagine by about this stage, um, probably a lot of his fortune would have been withered down. And so, you know, um, obviously there was income that also came from lawsuits, and we'll get to that. But this was quite important to, to write this book, to then um, present it to the public, to present themselves to the public. And obviously what happens then is they get asked some awkward questions like, Oh, by the way, have you taken a polygraph test? Oh, no, we haven't. We didn't know that we had to. And of course, the Boulder police jumped on the bandwagon and said, oh, yes, we do want you to take a polygraph. And the Ramses are like, oh, we've never really been asked that before. Um, it's not a problem. And so now in this whole campaign to show themselves innocent, now they need to really put their money where their mouth is and sort of bite the bullet and that is what they eventually did but that's a narrative on its own the whole polygraph narrative what i do find very ironic and quite fascinating in this particular interview is and it's in the segment right at the beginning where larry asks them you know what happened that night and i haven't played you the full segment but in the in the in the more complete segment um i think larry actually originally says what happened that day just a general statement it's quite an open statement. John can respond and Patsy can respond in any way that they want. You know, you say, well, so what happened that day? What else could he be referring to except what happened to John Bernay? And John asks him, are you talking about the 25th or the 26th? And then John talks in a very general way. He says, well, we were going to go to Michigan. And, and then he starts talking about his other family, you know, his children with it with with his first wife and in other words you know larry's trying to find out okay what happened you know you, you're trying to um tell the story that's why i've written this book so what happened that day and, and john takes the story right out of boulder and larry's got to stop him and say okay what happened that night right and when he says that patsy seems a little taken aback and she's now got to go through it step by step and eventually when John when Patsy's queried about the note you know did you take the note to John something that is is something that you would expect Patsy picked the note up and took it to John except that she didn't then John jumps in and he says we don't remember this is three years ago let's play that again you were not concerned about Burke did you check Burke yes we checked, we checked it really him. quickly yeah. you brought the note to John I don't remember, I tell you, you just, you know, that you morning is so note? chaotic. You no, don't? I don't remember exactly, but... Well, it was, it was, uh... I started screaming, there's a note, you know. And was, you look in John Bonet's room, she's not there. What's the first thing you do? Larry, we don't remember. This is three years ago. We've been through this a hundred times. You wrote a times. book about it, so, I mean, you must have said... We, we, we... Of course, the reason why there's awkwardness here is you want to say, well... Yes, we picked up the note and we read it and so on. But the problem is there's no fingerprints on the note. And so that's, that's, a, that's a problem. There are other things that are said here that, that don't seem to be entirely accurate. Try anything to revive her. 
I, I took the tape off her mouth. I tried to untie her arms. They were very tightly bound. I couldn't get the knot undone. Uh, and then I just, I, I picked her up. And I so the short answer there is that he didn't try to revive her. So Larry's question is, did you try to revive her? Answer, no. Um, he talks about all these other things that he does. It's up to the officer to pronounce that John Bonet is no longer alive. John's the last to know. Of course, when you read Orrin's report, it is pretty obvious that John Bonet was died. She's got rigor mortis. Also, the way John carries her, he's carrying her sort of at her waist. Her arms are um, rigid above her head. She's changed color in a way. Her, her lips are blue. And um, to Orrin, John Bonet not only was obviously dead, but she'd been obviously dead for a while. But John's completely unaware of this, and he needs the officer to inform him that that's the case. He talks about thinking that she's still alive, but he doesn't actually find out. He needs somebody else to find out, and he also doesn't try and um, resuscitate her. He needs somebody else to, I guess, decide whether to do that or not. And... Do you, do you think that that is very con a very convincing story? And what's quite interesting in this version is, is he says the, the, um, the ligatures around her wrists were very tight. And no mention that the, the one was just brushed off and that the other one, well, we know from the coroner that he was able to actually put his fingers underneath the, lig the ligature that had actually, um, that was still on. And bear in mind, it was tied around the 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 cl the clothing so the the sleeve of the arm and it wasn't flush with the skin and there was also no sign that it was um cutting into the skin or bruising the skin or chafing on the skin there was there was no sign of that whatsoever also in crime scene photos the that that piece of string that cord isn't cut in order to remove it from John Bonet's wrist. The one was one side was removed, but the other one didn't need to be cut to be removed, unlike the string from the toggle rope or the so-called garrote. That did have to be cut because of the, um, I think, partly the, the depth in which it cut into John Bonet's neck, but also there was a gold chain that was ensnared right into this um you know into that sort of cavity of the cord and the and the flesh and and so this chain would have made it very very difficult to quickly release john bonnet from the um asphyxia that was setting in especially in the dark especially at night especially if you didn't have the tools and possibly because it cut so far into your neck you might not have seen it immediately. You may not even have been aware that that was going on and, and just looking like John Bonnet was coughing or something like that. What I find quite interesting with this interview is how many times uh, Larry King asks John or Patsy a question and they answer that they don't remember. I mean, they are on his show to talk about the story and they seem to not have very good memories of what happened. My oldest and my youngest. What happened that day? December 26th. 6th. I don't remember, I tell you. You just, you know, that you morning how you got so chaotic. You no, don't? I don't remember exactly, but... Well, it was... Larry, we don't remember. This is three years ago. We've been through this a hundred times. You wrote a book about it. What did the police say? Did they say anything? Did they... Well, Linda Arndt uh, was the only police person that was there that I recall. They all had left. The others had left. Well, I don't know. I, I, there were a lot of people there. It was a blur. The morning. Yeah, it was a blur. Yeah. We had. And interestingly, in the book, that's the same thing that they say that that it was a blur. That the events sort of were a blur. In fact, on page seventeen of chapter three, dealing with midday of December twenty-sixth, which is when John discovers John Bonet. He says, and there's a quote from the first line or two from the from the chapter. He says, quote, sometime during the morning, 
events start to blur together in an unending string of police appearing, disappearing, doors opening and closing. He talks about um, his awareness disappearing at random. Um, he talks about confusion, noise, um, a swirling muddle of chaos. It's quite convenient that he can't really account for his movements or the movements of anyone else during this very important time of the investigation. What do they do? They, uh, a uniformed police officer arrived uh, relatively quickly and um, I said, I handed him the note, I said, my daughter's been taken. Uh, he said, gee, aren't you, sh you don't think she just ran away? And I said, for heaven's sake, she's six years old. No, she didn't just run away. Um, no sign of foul play at this point. So do you notice John says, I handed him the note. What does he say? I gave him the note. I said, I handed him the note. I said, my daughter's been taken. Now, what's quite interesting with this little snippet, and, you know, we're only six minutes into the whole 45-minute interview, and we're not going to go through the whole thing here because we've got to deal with Steve Thomas talking to Larry King, and this was a couple of months later, May 31st. And that's quite an explosive interview. But what is quite interesting here is John Ramsey licks his lips just before he talks about handing the officer the note. This is Officer French and saying his daughter is missing. I beg your pardon. He didn't say his daughter is missing. He said, my daughter has been taken. Right. So in hindsight, what we know is both of those things were were misleading, false and untrue, meaning John Bonet hadn't been taken. She was still in the house. Nobody had taken her. There, there, there were no kidnappers. No one had taken her out of the house. So, you know, if you were the officer, the idea of John Bonet being taken, you would assume, well, she's not there, right? And also, if you'd searched the house and not found her, you'd also assume, okay, John Bonet is not here, right? The other thing is the ransom note, the supposed um, ransom note, Suppo that is um, suggesting a kidnapper also appeared to be bogus and so the ransom note is also misleading the officer so just in the in this little snippet where John says I, I handed him the note and said my daughter has been taken from the police's perspective neither of those statements were true does that make sense now I want to just in a very simple specific way just examine what John Ramsey says here on CNN where he says um, I handed him the note and we're going to go to their own book The Death of Innocence to see what he says about this particular moment and so what's quite interesting on page 13 is John writes the following quote I meet Patsy and officer Rick French in the hallway near the front door I tell him my daughter has been kidnapped. Not that she's been taken, that she's been kidnapped. The uniformed officer walks in and asks us to repeat our problem again. He keeps asking questions and seems to grasp the situation quickly. And then he insists we move to the corner and that's basically the end of it. There's no reference here to a ransom note. And I think the reason that it's not included here is the difficulty that this involves is why on earth would you not have the ransom note at the front door why would you not hand it to the officer and in this interview on CNN John says that he did that that he handed the ransom note to the officer he talks about his head is spinning and all sorts of other things and then uh, a little bit further down page 14 he talks about another officer coming into the um, into the, the home and, and then he just says he is shown the ransom note and when you hear that it sounds like um, someone hands it to him or you know y y look this is the ransom note and it's in your hand but it's actually ambiguous to know what that means what does it mean he's shown the ransom note what it can also mean is you standing and the ransom note is on a table or on the floor or on the stair and you point to it and you say there's the ransom note. But why on earth wouldn't you be handling it? Why wouldn't you be reading it and going through it 
and passing it to Patsy and saying, let's try and make sense of this. Who wrote it? Um, what is this all about? What do we need to do? Right? I said, I handed him the note. I said, my daughter's been taken. Now, if we refer to page 476 of Paula Woodward's book, we have your daughter, and this is a section dealing with the officer Rick French's statement. Um, this is the first officer on scene. This is the officer John Ramsey is referring to. And this is a quote from Rick French's report, right? And he says, I responded to 755 15th Street in the city and county of Boulder, Colorado at approximately 0555 hours. In other words, that's when he responded. That's when he started going there, right? Upon arrival, he doesn't say what time he arrives, but we know it was shortly before 6 a.m. He says, I met with a distraught Patricia Ramsey and her husband, John. John advised me that their six-year-old daughter, John Bonet, was missing and that their nine-year-old son, Burke, was asleep upstairs. John directed me through the house and pointed out a three-page handwritten note which was laid on the wooden floor just west of the kitchen area. He told me that his wife had found the note on the bottom steps which led to the upper level of the house. And then he says in brackets here, I'm uncertain about who moved the note. And so you've got a really weird situation where there's a ransom note and neither of the Ramses are actually even holding it. The officer is sort of chaperoned to where the note is and the note at this point is actually lying on the ground, lying on the floor. And, and so I don't think you can really say I handed him the note. Can you? Some people ask why you didn't search the house right away, run through the whole house right away. We thought we were dealing with a kidnapping. Uh, we really did. We so no sense in didn't. Looking. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had, but we didn't. So this is also a very obvious question, but it's it's almost so obvious that it's not even worth asking. But it's like you are in this scenario anyway. You're confronted with a ransom note. We have your daughter. And then it's almost like this immediate acceptance. Oh, okay, she's gone. Uh, let's not let's not try and find out where she went, through which exit, you know, where the intruder came in, where they went out, or or even to verify where she is. So it's it's in this scenario, it's basically um, Patsy gets the ransom note, reads it very very quickly goes to John Bonet's room, opens the door, and suddenly it's, it's, it's abundantly clear John Bonet has been kidnapped. And so the next thing to do is basically call the police, right? Now, if you think about it in a logical way, if John Bonet wasn't in her room, in, if she wasn't in her bed, she could also be in the bathroom. She could have been on the toilet. Another thing that you might want to do in a legitimate scenario is turn the light on and another thing you might want to do is call out her name. Go through the house calling out, John Bonet, John Bonet, are you there? And as we know in the Chris Watts case, when Chris Watts returned from the well site and he went into the house ostensibly not knowing where his family was, he never called out anyone's name. He went through the whole house, never once calling out their name. Why? Because, well, didn't he know where they were? Didn't he know that they weren't there? And didn't he know that it was pointless calling out their name? In their own story, John and Patsy never go through the house and actually call John Bonet's name. Now, you must bear in mind it's a three-story house and there's a basement. So there's the scenario where the children could be in a different bedroom. They could have been in John Andrews' bedroom where... Clothing was being packed for the holiday they were about to go on. John Bonet could also have been in Burke's bedroom. Hi, Burke. Good morning. Is John Bonet here? Uh, John Bonet could also have been um, theoretically in the kitchen. She could have been in the lounge. She could have been um, less likely, but she could have been in the basement um, playing with Burke, playing with a train set or whatever. Um, she could have been in... There are a couple of, of toilets in the Ramsey home. Um, 
so those are all the alternatives. And so it's a very simple question. So is John Binet missing? And so this ransom note, which you don't really even read, you don't really get the sense that the Ramses themselves even read the ransom note, but they've immediately accepted, they immediately convinced that John Binet has been kidnapped. There's no attempt to identify the handwriting, and there's also not much of an attempt to look for John Binet. So at about 33, sorry, 35 minutes, 23 seconds, with about 10 minutes remaining, John's asked this question, you know, uh, what, didn't you actually bother to look for John Binet in the house? John Binet, while shaking his head, says, we thought we were dealing with a kidnapping. And so at about 35 minutes, 28 seconds, just after he said, we thought we were dealing with a kidnapping and I wish I had looked for her. We really did. Again, he sort of licks his lips. It's something that seems quite idiosyncratic to John. He often licks his lips. Um, and you can make of that what you want. You know, what is that all about? Do, do you really think John wished that he, he had searched the house and found John Bernay? Now, imagine that that did happen. Imagine that instead of calling the police at um, about 5.52 saying that John Bonet had been kidnapped, imagine it was a different call. Imagine the call was, say, at 2 a.m. and they'd actually found John Bonet and now the police were called and they were saying, OK, uh, please come here, our daughter's dead in the house. It would be a, quite a different scenario, wouldn't it? And then it would be, okay, so you found your daughter. Where, what were you doing? Um, and suddenly it would be a completely different situation. You wouldn't have a ransom note. You wouldn't have this delay. You would also probably have a time of death. And then you could also say, okay, um, let's look at what is going on in the house. Um, did anyone get in? Where were people? Where was John Bonet? Did John Bonet? Which bed did John Bonet sleep in? Where were where were all the people? And you know, find the evidence that's there. Bear in mind, in that case, would there have been a ransom note? Well, if you imagine that there wasn't a ransom note, what then? What what would you then pay attention to? Now, I've heard some people say, and it's quite a legitimate argument. In fact, I think it's an argument by. Lou Smith as well, is, he said something along the lines of um, there's no way that, um, and this is, was his way of arguing that the Ramses couldn't be involved. He was saying there's no way that if John Bonet died and the ransom note was written subsequent and if it was written by Patsy, that Patsy could have sort of held herself together, held her, you know, what, together kind of thing that she would have been too hysterical to, to do that. Patsy would have been too overwrought to concentrate on writing a ransom note. And I think it's a great argument. I think it's a really good argument to say um, that, that it makes sense that, you know, being confronted with the death of her own child, she would not have been able to think straight and to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I think that's a that, that is a very good argument. And because of that argument, Lou Smith and I think Lou Smith took that argument even further and said probably even even the guy, even the person who murdered John Bonet wouldn't be able to write the note after that either because he would be in a state of panic, etc., etc., etc. Right. I so I understand that argument. It's not a bad argument, but the counter to that argument is the following. It's not as though the ransom note needed to be written in 10 minutes immediately after the crime. It's also not as though Patsy killed John Bonet, so Patsy's now got that hanging over her. It's a little bit different to the perpetrator writing the note rather than somebody else writing the note. The other thing is Patsy was a journalism major, and Steve Thomas describes her as magna cum laude um, smart. And Patsy was someone who was used to performing. We see Patsy on television. We see Patsy on CNN. Patsy was often in pageants. And, and pageants are quite stressful. You know, you are under the, the cosh. You, a lot of people are watching you. And you need to perform under stress. And so wasn't this a situation like that? 
The other thing that I think is a counter to Lou Smith's story is that it's not as though the ransom note was written in one flourish. It was written, it looks like there was a practice ransom note, at least one that we know of. And it also looks like you know, it's possible that whoever wrote the ransom note could have had hours to write it. Probably not hours. It might have been written over one hour or possibly half an hour. But the point is, it's not as though um, the person who wrote the ransom note didn't have time to to calm down, to consider the situation, if that makes sense. I mean, I wish I had, but we didn't. Uh, in the book, you write about the suitcase in the open basement window, but the police say you never told them about it. Oh, that's that's false. Oh. I told Linda Arndt that I found the window open and I found a suitcase under the window. They have photos of this in their, in their crime scene photos. So that's quite an interesting criticism from Larry. I would have to go through my notes to confirm the veracity of it. But what he's trying to say is that in his book John talks about finding the suitcase in the basement and the basement window open and I think this was during one of his sorties I don't know whether he was with Fleet White at the time I would have to go and check but the allegation that's being made is that John independently went down and I, and I could be mistaken I'm just saying this off the top of my head that John kind of independently went down into the basement sometime after calling the police and discovered the suitcase and the basement window open. And his story, according to what I'm gathering here with Larry King, is that, well, yes, of course he told the police this. The thing that's a little bit odd about it is when, just before he found John Bonet, quote unquote, found John Bonet, uh, with Fleet White when he went down to the basement with Fleet White and actually what Linda Arndt asked him to do was search the house from top to bottom meaning ser start searching from the top not search from bottom to top and she said John immediately went downstairs and Fleet went with him and they immediately John sort of um, I guess directed Fleet to this um, window and, and showed him I think a piece of glass, a pea-sized piece of glass on the on the suitcase or or in the window or something like that. But this is the part that seems to be quite absurd to me and see what you think about it. Surely if John had discovered the basement window open and the suitcase and it mentioned it to any police officer, so in other words if this had been brought to the attention of an officer, there would be an immediate um, buzz of activity in the basement. In other words, a lot of the police officers would be hanging around that part and studying it at that time. In other words, it would cause the officers to gravitate clo very close, perilously close, to the ground zero of the crime scene, which is the wine cellar, which is a few feet away. So so what, what is being suggested here is, um, I know what John Ramsey seems to be saying. It seems to be saying, oh, no, I did tell Linda Arndt and she did nothing with that information. But if you think about it in a, in a more general sense, if you think about, okay, we are trying to find out where this child is. We also try, this is the police. We're also trying to find out if there, there's foul play, and we're also trying to find out if there is, um, uh, you know, breaking and entering going on. And then someone says to you, well, guess what? There's a broken window over here, and there's a suitcase under that window. It's very difficult to imagine that the police, and bear in mind there's a crime scene photographer who came there, um, I think between, was it 9 and 10 in the morning, something like that, or 8 and 10 in the morning? Um, I think it's Officer Veach took photos. So are you telling me if um, you'd brought this to the attention of the police, why wouldn't they then gravitate to this area of the crime scene? In other words, you'd have more than one officer just hanging around the basement going, could this be a point of entry? And looking around there, and wouldn't that inevitably lead to them um, approaching the, the wine cellar 
and wanting to know, okay, well, what is in here? And we know that Officer Beach actually um, did approach the wine cellar, found it, uh, a latch on the top, saw it, and just decided not to open it. And, and he kind of regretted that for many months after that, if not years, and berated himself over that. Fleet White, on the other hand, also went down, actually opened that wine cellar door, and... Um, didn't see anything because it was dark. He couldn't find the light. And that was in the morning. And John Ramsey, when he talks about going down there, I don't remember him ever mentioning that he turned the light on. He seemed to know that John Bonet was there and he seemed to see her. And I don't think Fleet, I don't know if Fleet White mentions John turning on the light. So it's interesting that Fleet White wasn't able to see into the room, but John was. If we go to the Ramsey narrative on page 22, dealing with this moment, this is from the death of innocence. He talks about a few minutes later, I'm at the door by the furnace. I open it and see John Bonet lying on the floor with a white blanket around it. He doesn't say anything about turning on a light. Don't worry about Burke at all, going to school. He went back to school, right? Not yeah. to worry about him. But we had, we had safety uh, precautions. I would not let him go back to school in Colorado with, uh, without safety precautions. So you had people We had a 911 him. system put in the school. We had uh, professional security on staff on the premises, and we had parents who were watching around the clock. So it's quite an interesting reference to Burke there that, you know, because of what's happened to John Bonet, we need all the security... And in fact, it was quite a different situation. Not going to go into too much detail here, but quite a different situation where I think the Boulder police wanted to provide security for Burke. And I think they decided amongst themselves that they were going to do something else. There's also a story that the principal of the school didn't want police on the campus because it, or even security teams because it was going to upset the children. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to play you a clip of Burke being asked about, are you going to school now? And this was on the 8th of January, so around about two weeks after the incident. But what is interesting is when he's asked, you know, are you going to school? He answers no, but not because there's a killer on the loose, because they want to avoid the media. Listen in. said that after school, there's always meaty people waiting there going, hello, hello, uh, did you see Burke in class today? <laughs> uh, no, I did not. I think he was absent. Huh? Oh, thanks. <laughs> huh. they go. So do you feel like you're pretty safe? Yeah. Yeah? By the way, you say you never saw the FBI that day. Did, did they eventually get involved? Were they no. eventually? Never got there. I don't there. think they were ever allowed to be involved, which was horribly frustrating. Kidnapping, aren't they? So the last thing I want to say about the... The book, The Death of Innocence, is what's quite interesting is that John Bonet doesn't appear on, on the book and neither does Burke. And the only two people who do appear on the book are Patsy and John. And it's quite interesting that the story is really about them. It's about their innocence. It's about them being uh, telling their story that they are innocent. It's quite interesting that Burke's just not there, he's not acknowledged on the cover, and that neither is John Bonet. This story is, a, uh, in terms of John and Patsy, this story is about them. It's not about John Bonet and it's not about Burke. And I think that actually speaks volumes, don't you? What I also think speaks volumes is the, of the major books written, on the Ramsey case, Patsy and John's book is almost the, I think it's the least reviewed. So from from what I can see on Amazon, The Death of Innocence has got 196 reviews, but Perfect Murder, Perfect Town has got over 200. And Steve Thomas's book has got 586, almost 600 views, so almost three times as many, right? And even Kolar's book, Foreign Faction, which I think was self-published, 
has more than double the number of reviews as de The Death of Innocence. What do you think that says? The, the number of people reading other versions of the event besides what John and Patsy wrote. And I conducted a poll on YouTube. Obviously, it's not a very big poll, not a very big sample. But of the 2,400 or so who voted, 65% felt that the Ramses aren't innocent and around 21% said that, that they didn't know. Only 14%, you know, barely over 10% felt in this sample felt that the Ramses are innocent. Anyway, this has been an unusually long episode. There's actually a lot more to have gone through in that interview. I will put a link to the transcript in the description so you can go through it at your leisure um, but that is it I'm not going to take it any further in the second part of this uh, episode on Patreon we're going to look at the Ramsey's taking on detective Steve Thomas basically Patsy's nemesis or I suppose you could see it in the other way detective Steve Thomas's nemesis and I think it was as a result of this interview that Steve Thomas was sued. I, I don't know how you would have been, how you would have avoided a lawsuit based on the book that he wrote anyway. But anyway, it's quite sad that, that uh, you know, he lost his job and he was also sued. I can't quite remember what the terms of the lawsuit were. I don't know if, if the proceeds of the book went to a Ramsey fund or whatever it was, but um, Detective Thomas was actually sued over this book. So he, he was really run through the, the the washer in terms of this case. He really seemed to sacrifice a lot and lose a lot. And so we're going to deal with that in the next segment. Thank you for listening. Uh, for those who have subscribed in the last day or so, the 100 or 200 of you, welcome to the channel. If you haven't subscribed, please do. And I'll see you guys next time. This man has, uh, has harmed us deeply. He's uh, uh, failed in his responsibilities as a police officer. He's failed us. He's failed John Bonet. He's failed the community in Boulder. Uh, it's not pleasant. No. Right. I still haven't heard the theory yet. I totally agree that whoever, whoever wrote this man's notes, whoever wrote this man's notes killed our daughter. Yes, I completely agree. Thank you. How is it exactly that you think that I killed my daughter? I just can't.